Afternoon folks, Adam from Arctic Lake Aquatics and today I'm going to be talking to you about using outdoor pond plants in your indoor aquariums and ripariums. So basically what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking advantage of the fact that it's coming to the end of pond season here in Calgary and we're going to be looking to see whether we can take advantage of some of the 50 to 75 percent off sales of outdoor pond plants and using them instead in our indoor aquariums. So stay tuned. So to give you a little bit of a preview about what you can do with a little bit of effort and a whole bunch of time, um, this is my 90 gallon blackwater uh, softwater riparian. Uh, all of this was done with about $40 worth of pond plants from a couple of seasons ago. So I basically went to uh, the garden center, found pond plants and plants that were um, okay with wet feet or roots that were exposed to the water all the time just started planting along the back of the aquarium and this is what I've ended up with. So, so if I zoom in a little bit closer uh, you can see that this is this is a 90 gallon tank that's got what's called a coast to coast overflow. So the overflow itself is done with what's called a bean animal um, overflow. And actually, I've forgotten to look up a, uh, an emergency line there, which I've got to correct when I get a second. Uh, but essentially, this it's a gigantic channel. You can kind of see the outline. Sorry for the glare. There uh, that flows along the back of what's generally a saltwater aquarium. This is a freshwater aquarium. But what we do with that channel is we fill it with plants, first of all, and then we top it with a layer of gravel or something that's not going to let the plants float away. Then we hook up some lights, and this is what's resulting. So uh, what I'm going to show you is a couple of pond plants that I've added recently here. Um, and then I've gone and picked up some more for our goldfish tank and we're going to show you how that works. So the two we're going to uh, focus on here are the pennywort, but these guys here. This is pennywort. Um, that can be grown both underwater and out of water like it's shown here. And there's uh, Marsilia nudica, which is this small uh, water clover, which again can be underwater or floating on the surface of the water or um, grown like here. So I planted these about two or three weeks ago and you can see what happens is uh, some of the roots or some of the stems will tend to die off a little bit as they're making a transition, but others are doing just great. So uh, particularly the pennywort's really taken off. So if we track all the way up here, you can actually see that there's a pennywort plant uh, or stem that used to be down about here that in two weeks has gone all the way up here. So we've made quite a huge difference and um, Basically all it does is it, it takes the, the waste from the blackwater fish and a little bit of aquarium fertilizer that I dose as well as that. And in addition to all these um, floating plants as well, which are also a, a present from the pond store, uh, I end up with quite a, a neat little setup here. So what I'll do is I just went out and picked up some more, like I said. I will show you the process of depotting them, how to choose them, and what to do with them when you end up wanting to use them in your aquarium. Okay, so I just got back from the garden center, like I said, and I've got two pots here. I picked up another pot of each one of those two plants that I was just talking about before. So this is the Marsilia. Uh, this is it's known as an upright water clover. And because this is a perennial in our environment, it's regularly priced at $10, and I got it for $2.50. So this, on the other hand, it was a pot, or is a pot, of uh, pennywort. This is apparently a perennial around here, which I'm not quite sure would survive the winter, but who's to argue? And so I paid the full price of $10 again for that. So when you get the pots, they will come looking like this. And the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, knock out all the extra soil and gravel that they come planted in. Um, I don't keep any of that. Um, I don't put soil in that uh, overflow there because all that happens is it eventually compacts with so much water coming over the overflow. Uh, eventually it clogs up and um, ends up just going in the sump and making a mess in the sump. So I keep it with fairly coarse gravel that I'm planting in, so I need to get rid of all the dirt and the gravel that it comes in. 
and I'll show you the process I use for doing that in a second. Uh, but what, what you end up with is, uh, this is kind of a half rinsed version. So I've gone to the garbage, I've um, over the garbage, taken it out of the pot, I've done some rinsing over the sink in a colander, making sure that uh, none of the dirt uh, actually goes down the drain and or none of the gravel goes down the drain because that does bad things to the sink and the carburetor. Um, and I will show you that process in just a second. So let me set up the tripod and I will come back to you in two minutes. Okay, so I've got my pod of Marsilia here, and I apologize if you can't hear me over the sound of the airstone there, but I will try and speak up. Um, the, the first thing you want to do is just sort of gently massage the pot. What that'll do is it'll break up the dirt adhering to the inside of the, the gravel layer, and then just sort of ease it on out. Um, you don't need to keep these if you want to recycle them or if you want to use them for outdoor planting, go ahead. So that's the plastic pot there. Uh, but what you're left with is a clump of dirt and rock and a whole bunch of uh, stems that seem to be fairly you know, deeply rooted in the, in the dirt. So depending on how uh, stiff the root structure is of the plants that you're talking about, what you want to do is very gently just start easing the dirt back. Um, Try not to spill on the floor like I just did. But what you want to do is being careful not to break up the roots. Try and get as much of the, the, the gravel and the dirt off of the plants as you possibly can. Um, with the Marsilia here, it's got such a fine root system that I'm not going to do too much of this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use some of the dirt to wash it off. A um, little bit easier to do with the pennywort because the root system is a lot more robust. So I was able to get about half of the dirt off doing this and then about half the dirt by running water over it. Um, if you wanted to do this outside, it would make even more sense, but it's a bit um, miserable outside. It's quite, fu quite smoky and quite windy at the moment, so I'm doing this inside. Uh, but we're about halfway done here, and this so this is about as far as I want to go before I can start feeling that I'm, if I were to pull any more, I'd start damaging uh, plant roots. So let me go and set up by the sink, and I'll show you how I finish this off. Okay, so now that we're back at the sink, um, I'm going to try and show you this without getting in the way of the camera. Let's we'll see how successful I am. But essentially what you want to do is have a colander to catch all of your dirt and all of your, um, your gravel. You don't want that going down the drain, really. Um, and what you want to do is, is set your, ho your tap so that it's not, not hot, not cold, so just sort of lukewarm water. I'm not sure if it's possible to shock plant roots, but it just seems friendly not to do too much in that regard, so keep your water reasonable. And then what you want to do is just slowly start running water over the, root, over the roots and gently teasing them out. So you can hear the sound of the gravel going into the colander, and you can see that it's slowly starting to um, capture most of the dirt. There is some of the fines that will end up going down the drain. Um, which is not ideal in the house, but normally I do this outside. I just wanted to make this an, an easy demo here. And so just keep doing that, keep teasing at the root ball. Um, once the roots are exposed, you want to try and get it in the tanks as quickly as you can. Um, try not to let the roots dry out because these plants don't really like having dry roots. That's the reason we're using them in an aquarium or a riparium. Um, so what I'll do here is just kind of keep going for a little bit, and then I will uh, I'll check back in when I'm all done with washing off the root system. Okay, so when we're all done, uh, you can see that I'm left with this looks like dirt, but it's actually a fairly uh, tightly meshed uh, root system. And it's attached to essentially a mat, or a, I'm not sure if it's a rhizome, but it sort of looks like an anubius rhizome. Um, I doubt that's the right term, but that's just sort of something you might be able to relate to. Um, and then it's got roots that kind of come off the bottom. So I've removed as much dirt and as much gravel as I can. Um, one of the reasons I removed the gravel for the application I'm going to be using it for next is it's going into a goldfish tank. Um, I don't really like fine gravel with goldfish because the goldfish can ingest it and do bad things to themselves. 
Um, if you were just going to put it into the overflow of the riparium, um, like the, the one that I've got there, you wouldn't have to get rid of as much of the fine gravel if you didn't want to, because um, no fish are going to be exposed to that. Um, the only thing that happens sometimes is some of my shrimp get into the overflow and they'll kind of graze among the plants there, but then they sort of hop back into the aquarium when they're done. Um, no fish end up actually going over the overflow because of the screen that I put up there. Uh, it's just that the shrimp can actually climb over that. So, um, and can, to kind of give you an example of the difference, um, so this is the Marsilia here. It's got a fairly dense root structure. This is the pennywort here. It's got a fairly loose root structure. Um, you'll have to sort of guess and test based off of whatever plants you end up using. Um, the goal is to just try and get rid of as much of the dirt as possible. Um, most of that is a combination of I don't want the dirt in my overflow, but I also don't really want the fertilizer that the dirt will have contained. So I dose my own fertilizer and I don't know what they've put on here from the greenery or from the, from the greenhouse or from the nursery. Um, I just don't really want to deal with um, whatever nitrogen spikes or anything like that might be part of the um, the original potting soil. So I get rid of it, I plant my own, and we move on from there. So at this point I'll give this these roots one more wash and then we're ready to go plant wherever you want to plant. So if you're actually buying an aquatic plant they will often give you this little handy guide. Um, in this particular case this is the um, the pennywort. So it's saying um, you can plant the actual roots 0 to 24 inches down and then it'll grow 4 to 8 inches above that on average. Um, you can already see that my pennywort is way more than 8 inches out of the water so take it with a bit of grain of salt but I would pay attention to this number down here the 0 to 24 inches. Um, be aware too that your plants may need a transition period so if you take a plant that's been grown out of water and you just dunk it underwater and you put it way down and you don't give it a lot of light, that's a great con that's a great uh, combination to have your plants completely die back on you. Um, I'll show you how I handle that a little bit later, but um, use this 0 to 24 inch number to determine which plants you're going to buy. So if you're going to buy plants that you're going to plant directly coming out of the back of the aquarium like you've got, like I've got shown here, you can pretty much grab anything because you could plant the crown right at the, the water surface and be in that zero inch range. Um, or you can grab another plant that doesn't mind having its crown sticking out of the water and go nuts. Um, so these levels down here, you can see it's kind of levels one, two, three, four, five, six. That's what people use when they're determining which plants to buy and which section of their ponds to plant in. And, and you can do that perfectly well in your aquarium as well. Um, the other thing to take a look at is this full sun to partial shade. Personally, I haven't had great luck with plants that need full sun. So anything that needs uh, partial shade, I've been able to grow without a problem inside. Um, and that's just because full sun is an incredibly large amount of light. I don't know if anybody's actually had a chance to put a par meter. A par meter is a light meter. Uh, that measures the intensity of light out in the sun, but it's way higher than just about any aquarium fixture you'll ever find here. Um, and that way, if you at least stack the deck in the case of partial shade or full shade, um, you'll, you'll end up with a plant that's probably going to do better inside. The, the zone hardiness, um, just a little point of interest for me, we're in zone 3-4 here. So that's why they call pennywort here a perennial, because in theory it wouldn't die over the winter and would be able to come back in the spring. No idea if that's the case, but um, not really super applicable inside. Likewise, this bloom time in summer and that sort of thing doesn't really matter to us. Um, I have seen a few, and I've sh I'll show you a few of the, the flowers that are flowering out of the back of the tank, but that's not really going to affect the ability for the plant to be actually grown inside. And then um, at the bottom is just a couple of tips. So handy oxygener and submerged plant just means that in the case of pennywort you can actually grow it completely submerged as well. And um, I, I have some pennywort like I showed you earlier that's growing out of the back of the tank. I bought this particular batch to be grown submerged and we'll see how it does.
So that's kind of another way you can determine how deep you need to, or how deep you can plant it. So um, in this case, you could probably plant it in a tank that's 24 inches deep. That's going to be a pretty deep aquarium for the most part. Um, but if you were to grab a fern or something like that, you'd want to stick in that zero inch range. If you don't end up um, buying a, a pond plant, and so you don't get a, a nice tag like this, uh, just make sure you bring your cell phone with you to the, to the garden center or bring a camera and snap a bunch of pictures and then do your research when you get home. Basically, I looked for any plant that was either in the um, lake's moist soil section or something in that regard. So anything that didn't mind it itself being in full, um, full water because you're going to get rid of the soil and plant it in the back of your aquarium or in your aquarium. So those are kind of good tips for choosing plants. Other than that, the choice is up to you. So if you're going to be using your plants in uh, a riparium or an overflow or some sort of box like I'm using here, in order to plant them, what you'll end up doing is um, I've got a plant medium, which you probably won't be able to see here, but there's a whole bunch of little spheres that are used generally in hydroponics. I'll try and grab a picture and insert it somewhere around here. Um, I filled the overflow up to about here with those little hydroponic um, clay beads. They're, they're expanded clay beads, I think. And then there's a cap of about an inch to an inch and a half of uh, black rounded kind of aquarium gravel. The reason I do that is because if I used only the expanded clay beads, um, the beads themselves float and so you wouldn't be able to plant much of anything in there. And the reason I don't use full aquarium gravel is because it's a bit expensive and to fill up something like this you'd, you'd require quite a bit of it. So the uh, expanded clay beads are super cheap and they're a great hydroponic growing medium so this is basically what we're doing here. And so you start off by, if you're doing it the same way I did, uh, filling it up with the hydroponic beads and then filling the top up with gravel. So kind of a nice compromise is to put in the hydroponic beads. If, you, if you're gonna do it dry, plant all your plants, then cap it with the gravel and arrange your plants so that um, they're kind of positioned where you wanna go. And then if you're like me, you let nature take its course and prune as you see fit. Um, I'm not sure, honestly, how you'd be able to do this as a serious aquascaper without driving yourself completely and totally insane. As you can tell, I kind of like the jungle look, and so it's been survival of the fittest. Um, this, essentially what's grown has grown, and what's sort of not grown has not grown. Um, these little um, plants here, I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head but they've been sort of outcompeted over the years by the ferns. The ferns grew really slowly at first and they've really exploded. Um, I've sort of had some stuff shade out. I didn't realize that this had died out here back here, but I'll clean that up in a second. Um, and things have sort of grown or subsided as, as they've needed to. So there you go. That's all there is to it. So here you can see the pennywort um, growing out at the top of the tank. I've had it so that the, I just kind of dropped it in the tank, which means that the lily pads or the leaves or whatever you want to call them are right at the surface of the water. Um, and then if I look down here, you can see the roots are just kind of loosely dangling. Um, I do that because it eases the transition of the plant into the water. Um, the closer the leaves are to being grown out of the water, the easier access they have to carbon dioxide and that way um, it because they're grown out of the water they're not going to like being thrown directly under the water and not have access to carbon dioxide and light in the same way that they would if they were out of the water so as I'm transitioning this plant to growing underwater this kind of makes it a little bit easier uh, likewise with the water clover the marsilia um, I just sort of balance it on top of the sponge filter here so I gotta get rid of some of this algae but um, that way, the closer they are to the surface and the more oxygenated they are, the easier it is to um, transition them to growing underwater. So uh, this tank is sort of being used as a holding tank for some plants that are 
having trouble. The goldfish work great because they produce a lot of nitrate and it sort of allows me to use this as a bit of a plant nursery. And then once they're good to go, I plant them a, a little bit more in an organized fashion. Okay, so when I had mentioned that uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to take some newer plants and not submerge them as far, um, one of the options is to get one of these shower caddies that has a couple of suction cups on the back and use those uh, suction cups sort of midway along the aquarium so that um, the tops of the plants are poking out of the water to some degree. That will, again, um, ease their transition. Uh, another option, I've got this little uh, converted uh, hospital tank, beta tank thing. Um, I did the same thing. I drilled holes in the back, added four suction cups, and then Swiss cheese the front here with um, holes to allow circulation of water, and that worked reasonably well too. Uh, I got a little bit heavy for the suction cup, so that's the reason I sort of retired that. But these uh, little shower caddies seem to be a good balance of suction cup area to um, mass, I guess. Um, so to give you a sort of a better example of what's in that um, overflow, these are the uh, expanded clay pellets. I think they're called Hydropon or Hydroton. Um, that's kind of a trade name, and they're you can get an expensive version at Ikea, um, or if you've got a hydroponics place locally, which I'm lucky enough to do, you can buy them in a huge bag. Not very expensive. And then this is the sort of aquarium style, um, looks like granite or something like that, um, capping rock that I use. So that's kind of just a good uh, way of looking at it without it actually being covered in water and having plants poking out of it. My aquarium tank again. Um, and I just thought I'd give you a couple of points on maintaining uh, these sorts of plants. So what I end up using here, and the camera probably won't like that very much, but I use uh, two dual tube LED shop lights from, um, in my case, I got them from Costco because I'm in Canada. Um, Corey from Aquarium Co-op did a review on similar lights that he found down in the States. So depending on which part of North America you're in, I'll link to his video uh, here and you can take a look at that. These lights seem to have the same spectrum and the same performance near as I can tell. So feel free to, to take a look. Um, as you can see, it grows plants just fine. Uh, this is a 6400 Kelvin, or sorry, it's a, a 5000 Kelvin instead of 6400 Kelvin light, which means it's a little bit more yellow. I'm not sure if the camera will be able to show that. Um, works great for my blackwater riparian because it gives that kind of orangey glow. Uh, you may want to invest in a different um, light if you like it more crisp and white. Personal preference. Uh, but as you can see, other than a dying pond leaf in the back, which I trim every now and then because they sort of start to shade each other out, um, I've got plants that are flowering. Um, I've got air plants here, which are a different sort of plant. Um, I dunk these in the aquarium. These guys get dunked in the aquarium once a week for about an hour. Um, and everything else just sort of picks up uh, fertilizer from the water. So these floating plants here, for example, I scoop um, three or four huge handfuls out of here every single week. So I get it to the point where I can see about three quarters of the water surface. And by the end of the week, it looks like this. And this is actually starting to shade out some of the plants that are underwater. So it seems to work pretty well. Um, on another note, I'm apparently a bit of a hoarder. And so I did have a record of what those floating plants were. So the um, half of the floating plants are, I'm gonna say Phylanthus fluitens. Um, the mortals version is red root floater. And so that reproduces extremely quickly. Um, seems to do very, very well. I can get it to go a little bit red if it's right underneath that T5 bulb, which is right underneath the, or sorry, which is right over top of the, the aquatic section. So, uh, but for the most part, it stays pretty green. I think I have to have way more iron in the water than I ever do to get it to go really red. And then the other uh, part of, the other mix in there is uh, Salvinia natans, which is a fern. It's uh, just a gen sort of generic water fern. And that's the stuff that sort of looks like a really open Venus flytrap. It's kind of got um, little fuzzy hairs all over the place, which you can kind of see there. So um, those are really good. Again, I think I paid 
six or seven bucks for a tub of each one of these, and now I've basically got a lifetime supply unless I kill it off or unless the goldfish eat it all or something like that. So I don't know if you can see underneath here. This is actually shooting up underneath, uh, looking at the surface of the water. You can see all my cherry shrimp grazing on the roots of the floating plants. Um, just kind of a cool shot. And this is also why I need to be a little bit careful about clearing out these floating plants because the second I come down, I you can barely see um, any light getting to the submerged plants. And so if you're going to use floating plants, uh, be a little bit careful to keep the, make sure you're not obscuring the light that's getting down to them. Or use plants that are really tolerant of very low light conditions. Um, likewise, all of these plants started from little baby plants. What I'll do here is I'll go dig up uh, what I started with and you can kind of see the progression that's happened over the last uh, year and a bit. Okay, so here's the setup that kind of got me started. On the top right corner there you can see the hydroton or the expanded clay pellets that I've been talking about in a couple of places in this video. Those are the two bags that actually came from Ikea and that's kind of what got me started out. Um, the, the grain size on the Ikea um, hydroton pellets is actually quite a bit smaller than the stuff that I got from the hydroponics place. So I my pet theory is that maybe Ikea gets kind of the off cuts or the, the ones that don't quite make the grade in other places, but um, it's ironically twice as expensive as the stuff from the aquarium store or the, the hydroponics store, I should say. So those are your kind of your two options for places that I know of to get that stuff. Now in terms of the plants, um, if you look in the bottom left corner, you'll see a plant with green leaves and white roots, or white uh, veins in the leaves. And then there's a plant kind of in the middle, two, two to the right of it, that's got green leaves and red veins. That's called a Fetonia plant. Um, I've, sh I've shown you the red Fetonia in its, you know, one last remaining stem. Um, it's not one that I would really recommend. It will grow in a riparium, and I've had other people that have managed to get it to grow, but um, it's not one that really particularly likes the environment that it's being put in. And as soon as the leaves touch the water, they tend to rot back pretty quickly. So I'm pretty appalled when I see on a relatively regular basis this plant being sold as an aquarium plant by sort of less reputable stores. Uh, it's very definitely not. Likewise with that little pink leaved plant in the middle, I can't remember what that guy's called, but it is very definitely not one that was very happy in the setup it, and it would be terrible underwater. Now if you look in the top left corner, um, the plant that's kind of got red and yellow leaves uh, or veined leaves, that's called a croton plant. That did uh, pretty well, it, it managed to survive uh, it, and it grew a little bit, but it very rapidly got overtaken by some of the other plants. And so that's not one that I would tell you is going to grow very quickly for you. Not one that I'd necessarily grow uh, buy again, but it's uh, inexpensive and fairly readily available. So um, likewise on the bottom right corner, you can see two uh, pots of what sort of look like a fern. That one was sold to me as a moss, um, or it was labeled as a moss. Uh, didn't really look like any moss that I'd ever seen before. I think it was called Christmas moss, the one with the yellow, um, the sort of yellowish leaves on it. But I was never able to really do very much with those, and I couldn't figure out how to really get them in a riparium setup. Um, it, they're both planted in dirt and they have a, a defined root structure so it would be very different than something like a java moss or a christmas moss in the way that we as aquarists would would understand it not one i'd recommend likewise with the fairy moss that's in the middle there the very fine leafed moss or an asparagus moss i think i think i've seen it, it called otherwise not ones i'd grab again um, likewise in the very middle you can see a sort of a narrow leafed plant with white edges on it that's a spider plant uh, lots of people have great success with that one in their riparians, um, and they're cheap. They, they're set, they're, they'll certainly um, be available just about anywhere you look. Um, it's not one that ever took off for me. I think I probably planted the crowns of the, the plant a little bit too deeply, and so it kind of stuck around for a while, but I found any time that the leaves touched the water, it rotted back, and it's not one that I found particularly attractive, so I didn't make any special effort to make sure that it took off. So, and that now in, in terms of the plants that did really very well, and those are the ones that are sort of remaining, um, those two plants at the top are two different palms. 
that were only labeled palms. Um, I was those those have really exploded, and you can see them all over the video here. Um, I can't actually even differentiate which palm is which anymore, but um, they've certainly done really really well, and the the, the leaves or the stems on them are starting to become really quite thick and growing quite wonderfully. So definitely a thumbs up for me on them. Um, likewise, the plant with the green leaves and the brown spots on them. And then there's a, another plant over to the right with uh, green leaves, red uh, veins, and sort of a yellow middle. Those are apparently the same plant or the same sp uh, family of plant anyway. They're known as prayer plants. Um, those have done extremely well. Uh, the plant that's got the red veins on it is actually kind of cool too because the leaves will actually move in response to changes in light. So um, be aware that you, until you, you hear about that or until you uh, notice it, you'll one day come by, you'll see the leaves of the plant in the water, you'll move the plant around, it'll be fine for a couple hours and you'll come back and the leaves will be back in the water or something like that. Um, it's actually the plant moving, you're not going crazy and the plant isn't falling over. So. I just sort of let it do its thing and sometimes the leaves are in the water and sometimes they're not. Um, and then in the very, in the front row in the bottom, sort of the second plant from the left, that's an umbrella plant um, and they've just absolutely taken over. So most of the riparian itself is actually uh, dominated by those um, umbrella plants. There are a couple of different varieties that you might come across. The ones that I've had really success with are the ones that are known as just umbrella grass or um, baby tut or anything like that. Um, those ones seem to do pretty well. They're they're sold as a full sun, part sun, but they've done just fine on with my indoor light. Um, the giant dwarf papyrus or papyrus, sorry, um, they didn't do very well at all. I gave them access to as much light as I could, but they never really took off indoors. Um, I think those are more of a pond plant. Um, likewise, with the other two uh, tags that you can see here, the fiber optic glass or grass or the uh, prairie fire sedge, both sold as sort of uh, marginal plants um, or um, riparian type plants. I was never able to get them to grow indoors, so I would kind of take those with a bit of a grain of salt. But as usual, I mean, if you if you wanted to give them more light or if your conditions are just a little bit more favorable, there might be a pH or a water condition too that wasn't very favorable in my case, feel free to give them a go. Nothing here was all that expensive and it's kind of fun to see what you can get to grow on your own. So just a, a few notes here about plant maintenance. So you can see in a few of the, the plants here, they're starting to get brown tips. A lot of that has to do with the fact that these pond plants come from marshlands that have quite a bit of humidity. And here I'm lucky if I get anywhere between 10 and 30% humidity on any given day. Even having these open top tanks here, I don't have to run a dehumidifier. Um, on a really humid day, assuming it's not raining and it's 100% humidity, but uh, I might get to 50% here. So um, I just sort of attribute a lot of this to the fact that um, it's just really dry here. So a lot of the newer leaves don't seem to have the problem, but as they start to get a little bit older, they'll get these brown tips. I've experimented with misting the plants on a regular basis. Um, I don't know if it made much of a difference and I'm too forgetful to do it all the time. And you can also see that, you know, I haven't mounted my lights high enough, so they're actually growing past the light or past the lights, but um, these temporary light mounts need to get replaced anyway, so I might adjust those heights later on. Um, ideally, I'd actually like to put uh, pot lights in the roof, but that's becoming a little bit of a tangent and probably not going to be um, family approved, let's put it that way. So if you do start noticing the brown tips, that can actually be a variety of things. I attribute, in my case, this to being um, low humidity. Some plants respond to, or were some plants have brown tips in response to too much humidity, uh, particularly around the roots. <laughs> I mean, because this is an aquarium, I'm not able to do much about that. And in that case, I would imagine, you know, if that was the actual case here, I'd imagine all the plants would have that, but they don't. Um, it just seems to be some of the older shoots um, or some of the, um, the ones that are not just growing as well, so they're not getting as much light, for example. So eventually what I do is I just pull these out. Um, you can either leave them and they'll die off naturally or you can pull them out or you can trim them back or 
do whatever you'd like. So um, this is starting to get a little bit crowded back in here, so I should probably thin the herd a little bit anyway. But if you do see that, um, it's not something I've gotten a definitive answer on it, but that's kind of my thoughts on it. Oh, um, and actually on the brown tips thing, that can also be caused by plants dipping their leaves into the water, <laughs> which is should be fairly obvious because if it starts to rot back uh, where it enters the water, that should be fairly easy to pick up. So I don't think that anybody will have any questions about that part. Um, and then so in terms of a fertilizer regime then, they obviously don't need watering because that's what the aquarium brings. But for a fertilizer, I end up using an all-in-one fertilizer from a company up here in Canada. And I'll go grab the bottle here for a quick frame of reference. So I use uh, an aquarium fertilizer called Thrive. If you've uh, seen Corey's uh, Easy Green, it's the same sort of concept, but it is a, it's, it's more strongly concentrated, I'm told, than um, Easy Green. I can't get Easy Green up here in Canada, so I look for something similar. Um, I've also uh, fertilized this plant or this tank with uh, PPS Pro as well. Um, I don't do the water changes that are part of the PPS Pro system. I just used uh, a dry fertilizer uh, kit that I got from the plant guy. Uh, he's a plant vendor up here in Canada. I made up the reference solution and then dosed that until I sat at about uh, 20 to 30 uh, parts per million nitrate. So. That's the level that I maintain here. So it doesn't really matter, honestly, what it says on the bottle. In this particular case, it says for lower light tanks, use this. For higher light tanks, use that. Um, as you can probably imagine, this is not a normal tank. <laughs> so if I were to just dose via the what it says on the bottle here, I'd probably end up in a bit of trouble. Um, I don't have a lot of fish in the tank itself. So for the size of tank, it's actually stocked fairly lightly. I've got a half dozen Farloellas, uh, 16 uh, Brocus Splendens, which are emerald quarries, uh, four giant autos, and somewhere between 12 and 20 regular autos. Uh, they, and then about 500 red cherry shrimp as well. So this is a soft water tank. It's all done with RO, and so the only thing that fertilizes the plants other than the fish wastes is the, are these fertilizers. So I can pretty much feed as heavily as I want and these plants use up way more of the nitrate than the fish produce. So works for me, it's a pretty good setup. So uh, the only water changes I actually end up doing on this tank are I will uh, top off the sump when it starts to get low. So this the sump is starting to get a little bit low here, so I'll top it up to the point where it's at my high water mark. I can't quite fill it to the very top, otherwise if the power shuts off, the sump would overflow. Uh, but in terms of water changes, probably once every six months, I'll change out 20 gallons of RO water because bringing in fresh water seems like a good thing to do. It gets rid of some of the fish hormones and things that the plants may not actually take up, but I will fully admit that that is completely superstitious behavior and has nothing to do with anything here. So, like I said, if you're interested in learning about uh, riparian plants um, or using plants from your garden center either in your aquarium underwater or here, hopefully this has been a good resource. If you have any questions, uh, drop them down in the comment section below and I'll, I can make follow-up videos or I can answer them right there. Um, I will head off one question in that somebody's going to ask me what are these plants here. I can't actually tell you because I don't remember. I know um, you've got some prayer plants in here. You've got a fern, which I've long forgotten the name of. Um, I can go and dig through my storeroom and see if I have the original plant tags. But in a nutshell, just look for something. Most ferns will be okay. Um, look for something that likes moist soil and look for something that's relatively hardy and then plan on chucking a bunch of things in the back half of them dying, half of them growing, and you end up with something that kind of looks like this. So I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm. This has been a test tank, quote unquote, for about two years now, and it's going to eventually get broken down this year and rebuilt. So I'm looking forward to reusing the plants and setting things up a little bit more um, properly. 
So, uh, sorry, and I keep remembering things at the last minute, but one thing I will make a comment of is if you're going to use this much plant growing out of the water, use plants underwater if you're going to use any that aren't very demanding of nutrients, or just accept the plants underwater are going to suffer because the, the growth that's coming out of the top of your aquarium is going to dramatically outpace the growth that's underwater. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. First, much more uh, carbon dioxide in the air than there ever will be in the water, even if you supplement CO2. And the second is there's just there's more or less unlimited room to grow up here, and they're not fighting with... Um, they're, they're able to uptake uh, nutrients far more effectively than the, the aquatic plants are going to. So uh, the only plants I have underwater are Anubias and Java Fern. They look okay. Um, I can grab some still photos of those uh, or some video if I can wait till the evening and grab that when there's not so much glare. But the, the, the quality of your underwater plants will suffer a little bit um, and that's just due to the fact that the plants growing out of the top are going to outcompete them. So as, it, as in everything, it's going to be a bit of a balance. Um, the pluses of doing this are going to be that you can use fish that would ordinarily eat plants. So it might be a great idea for a cichlid tank. Um, your cichlids, for the most part, um, are going to be non-plant friendly or they're going to require pretty tough plants. In this case, they don't even have access to the plants and you get the benefits of the, the plants filtering the water for you. If you want something that looks cool and is kind of a conversation piece, this is definitely a little bit different. And then, um, in my case, because this is a South American tank and a softwater tank, this kind of has the jungle feel that I was looking for. So, there you go. Otherwise, um, this has been Adam from Arctic Lights Aquatics, and I hope you have a great day. And once again, if you have any questions, shoot me a comment in the comment section.